Welcome. With so many schools moving their classes online, we asked one of our leading authors with a great deal of online teaching experience to share her tips for creating an effective learning environment in an online course. Let me introduce you to our presenter today. Sharon Bookbinder is a professor and program coordinator uh, in charge of the Master's in Healthcare Management and the Bachelor's in Business Administration at Stevenson University Online. With that, I'm going to turn things over to Sharon. Hi, everyone. I'm so glad you're here. I hope everyone's safe and staying home and flattening the curve. I'm Dr. Sharon Bookbinder. I've been teaching fully online for over 15 years. And it wasn't like I leaped into teaching online. It wasn't anything where somebody, I just woke up one day and said, wow, that'd be a fun thing to do. Uh, what happened was I was uh, promoted to full professor at uh, my previous university. And I was uh, promoted also to chair of the department. And I was still teaching my eight course load. And I was also director of the undergraduate program in healthcare management. So anyone with half a brain would have said no, but I said, yes, I can do it all. And then I realized there wasn't any way that I could go to meetings as an administrator and meet my courses three times a week, four times a week, five times a week. So I was uh, thrust into learning how to teach online uh, very early, and that was uh, what I had to do. And so like you, I was, I was anxious, I was scared, but I knew it was something I had to do. I knew otherwise I really couldn't get everything done. What we're facing now in higher education is a black swan event. Uh, if you look it up uh, in any numerous places, uh, some people say it's something you can never return from, and I don't believe that. What I think it really means is it's almost like a Phoenix event, and I don't mean to promote that university, but we will rise from this. We will be more resilient, and we will have to take risk, and we're going to have to learn to be more flexible. And so with that in mind, I'm going to share with you the objectives for this presentation. By the end of this webinar, participants will be able to, number one, generate student-faculty contacts, which is a thing we really miss when we go from face-to-face -to, -face to an online setting. I know that that's very hard on us. Uh, number two, we're going to encourage reciprocity and cooperation among students, and we'll show you how to do that. Uh, number three, we're going to apply the principles of effective feedback. Uh, we're going to emphasize time on task and deadlines. We're going to communicate, communicate high expectations. And we're going to create a space for diverse talents and ways of learning. And I'd like to note that these uh, objectives are modified from a peer review guide for online courses at Penn State. We're going to talk about the first objective. In generating student-faculty contacts, there are some key places, and we'll discuss them a little bit more in detail after this. But first of all, there's faculty information, there's the syllabus, there's posted announcements, class conference calls, discussion boards and water coolers, which is a form of discussion board, and emails, phone calls, and text. So. Faculty information. If you look at a wide variety of faculty headshots, as I do, uh, because I'm an observer for many, many courses across programs. I'm a guest observer. I observe for reviewing people for promotion and tenure. I reserve, do annual reviews for adjunct and full-time faculty. And so this is something that I've become very sensitive to. On the left, you see my smiling face. And I do this on purpose because I want to be approachable to my students. They, first of all, when you're teaching online, they can't see you unless you do a conference call with you. So most, you know, right now, students are just as scared about moving on to online as we are. I was at the grocery store yesterday, got in my last minute shopping, and a guy behind the counter, nice young man, I said to him, how are you doing? We talked about fishing because uh, it was a fish counter. And I, I said to him, what are, you, you know, what are you up to? And he goes, well, I'm getting my degree online now because our university shut down you know, face to face. And, I said, and he says, I'm really nervous. And I said, you can do it. And he and I had a nice conversation about that. And so part of the constant messaging we must give our students and ourselves is you can do it. Now, the lady on the right of my screen, who is beautiful, uh, she looks really serious. 
And not only is she looking really serious behind her, there's a whole lot of scary uh, diagrams and numbers and equations on the board. And I am not a math phobe per se, but I'm certainly a calculus phobe. So this photo would make me wonder, oh my God, am I gonna be able to make it through this course? So do post your headshots, but make sure that it's something that you would say, is the student gonna be afraid of me when I post this? Am I too serious? Ask a family member to help you with that, help you pick out a picture. There's always one picture that your family member loves that you may or may not love, but you may wanna try that. Gonna do some do's and don'ts about faculty information. Do post your name and degrees. Do post your contact information, the welcoming headshot, your virtual office hours, and your teaching philosophy and your bio. Uh, the reason you want to have all this information in there is because, like in face to face classes, students need to be able to reach you. And office hours continue to be critical, whether they're in person or online. You can set up your time. I do my office hours on a, a by appointment only. And you can set those times and set up those uh, telephone calls with your students. Your bio is really important for students to get a sense of who you are. And your teaching philosophy is the same way. Uh, don't leave a blank faculty page or an empty spot where a photo should be. Uh, in you know Twitter talk, we call that the egg. We never talk, talk to somebody on Twitter who has an egg and no picture. Uh, don't post your home address and home telephone number unless you want students showing up. And don't post your info with spelling errors because you're the instructor. They're going to be looking at you and thinking, well, if she made spelling errors, I guess I can make spelling errors too. The syllabus. As you can see, this young lady is working very hard at making sure everything's correct. And that's what we have to do as well. We need to match the syllabus to the online course. I recently reviewed a course with an adjunct faculty member who had uh, his online course look great, had the deadlines in it, but his syllabus was blank. All he had was the template that we'd given to him to post, and he was supposed to fill it out, and he didn't. So here's the problem with that. Students like to have information in multiple spots. And many students will download the syllabus and put it in three-room binder. I know, crazy, right? Still printing stuff out. But that's how our students are. And the calendar is the most critical piece of that syllabus for them. Uh, we need to have attention to details. Uh, inconsistencies between the syllabus and the online course really cause confusion. And I'm speaking from experience here. I once had the wrong date for one module that didn't match with the syllabus. I heard from one student 227 times why this had ruined her life. So you don't want to ruin somebody's life. I'm, I'm not making that up. Uh, she was a little bit exaggerating, but anyway, don't, don't do it. Uh, most universities have a template, like ours does, for syllabi that includes course name, number, description, and prerequisites. Uh, you want to have those objectives in there, the, the learning objectives. That's really key in terms of assessment. Uh, you're also going to make sure you want to have required text and readings. You may have some readings that are online. Maybe you're using open source materials. Um, I'm hoping that you use my text, but anyway, you want to have university policies, your assignments and the weighting of the assignments, because students want to know how much work they're going to be expected to do, and we'll come to that more later in terms of different assignments. And you want a detailed description of assignments as well as the course calendar, the all important course calendar. Here is a little admonition from my son. My son obtained his master's degree in exercise physiology and injury prevention from a leading uh, university in the country. He was so angry at one of his professors that he would call me and yell at me because his professor did not respond to emails for three weeks. So he called those crock pot courses. So you don't want to set it and forget it. These are not crock pot courses. Crock pots are for cooking and not for teaching. Announcements is a really important way for you to stay in touch. Again, this should be weekly. And in your first announcement, you want to welcome the students to the course and give them a brief description of what to expect. I like to include the catalog description, 
I also like to include at that point any mandatory assignments that they must participate in in order to meet federal requirements for participation. Anything else that you might be doing uh, the following week, that's a good place to put it. I really look for a posted announcement each week when I'm reviewing courses at the minimum, and they should include debriefing of the previous week's work, positive feedback to the group about their performance, remember they're nervous, constructive feedback on areas needing improvement, a reminder of what you're covering next week, and assignments and due date for next week. When I talk about positive feedback, great job, I really was happy with your engagement, thanks for getting over the challenges of this new format, I really appreciate your can-do attitude. Constructive feedback can be something like, now, we need to have a little chat or something along those lines about your APA formatting, and I know that's a particular bugaboo of my students. And that's where you can provide them coaching or links to uh, your library or to APA's website uh, that gives them instructions on how to improve that. So that's a, that's a good way to do it, but always start with positive feedback followed by constructive feedback. Urgent or emergency announcements should also be emailed. So um, if you are saying, you know, that there's something that you need to, for them to know immediately, oh, there's an error in the syllabus. Thanks to Joe for telling us this, uh, you know, post that immediately with a correction. Class conference calls. This is one of my favorite pictures. Uh, this is a Zoom meeting participant. Well, this is the instructor, obviously, on the left, uh, audio only. We're in our pajamas. Our hair is not done. We don't have any makeup on. And then the Zoom meeting with video. That's a good looking dog on the right with the sunglasses looking sharp, all made up. So this is this is one of my particularly fun pictures. Class conference calls are really good for helping to set the tone. You can set up a conference call for the classes to meet you and the other students. This is a way that you connect with your students, that you make that engagement, and you can time it for when your class is used to meet. So if you're a Monday, Wednesday, Friday from 10 to 11, set it for that time. Or if that's not how you did it, or if you prefer to, you can use Doodle, uh, which is a great tool for setting up meetings. You can do group meetings or individual meetings to set up a convenient time for the majority. I like to use BlueJeans because that's embedded within my academic learning system. Uh, Zoom is also popular. I've heard some caveats in using Zoom that include uh, potentially allowing external parties to access students' information. And so be very careful with that and check with your university first to see if you can use that. Otherwise, you can do a phone call. Um, because I have blue jeans, I record this call for students who are not able to attend it to view it later. I have a lot of students working in healthcare, God bless them, and a lot of working students at the undergraduate level, so I try to make it so it's convenient for them as well. Uh, the conference call sets the tone for the course and gives the students an opportunity to ask questions about assignments. I have a huge assignment in one of my courses on quality management and patient safety. And it's a group assignment. Don't start screaming. It is a group assignment. And the group assignment is one of the most terrifying things to students in general. This is a good time to have that conversation, to discuss it in detail. And I actually require students to bring me questions. Each group has to bring me five questions about the assignments or they get deducted, you know, 10% from the assignment. So that makes them stay on their toes, makes them be attentive and gives them something to talk about when they meet with you. Uh, student feedback has been very positive for this. Some professors in my program like to do this weekly. Um, it's up to you if you really want the connection, if you really want a preview. Depends if you're teaching graduate or undergraduate level. Um, that's totally up to you, but students love it. Objective two, encourage reciprocity and cooperation among students. Discussion boards and water coolers. These are the places where you're generally speaking going to find that uh, that tool that you can use to assess the engagement. Discussion boards not only facilitate professor to student contacts, but also reciprocity and cooperation among students. An introductions discussion board is a good place to post your short bio again. 
not only in your faculty information, but under that discussion board. Greet each student by name when they post an introdu introduction and comment on something they said in their intro. Um, I have a lot of students who write back to me, gosh, I didn't know you were the author of the textbook I'm using for the course, which I always find pretty funny. Um, the students uh, have lots of different backgrounds. You can ask them, you know, what they're doing now. You can, you can make the assignment uh, fit whatever you think is appropriate. Uh, you can ask them a fun fact. Uh, I have a colleague who does truth, truth, lie. Uh, students have to post two truths and a lie about themselves, and sh that's very fun, and the students really engage in that. A water cooler discussion board is a place where students can ask questions about the course. Uh, often other students have the same ones. You know the ones in the back row with the baseball caps pulled over their faces. Well, we call them lurkers in classrooms. And you can respond in the water cooler, and you can also post that question and answer and announcement to ensure wider coverage to your audience. And when you do this, I recommend that you also have it emailed at the same time. Your announcements should have that capability. Now, should they discuss or not discuss amongst themselves? Discussion forums are a way to demonstrate student engagement, and I bolded that on purpose. This is about the students and them doing the work. So, how do we grade this work? First of all, uh, the students should not be allowed to get off with, hey, that's a great idea, me too. Uh, they need to give something substantive back to the class, because that's part of the peer-to-peer -peer learning. You do this by having a clear grading rubric, and you're gonna hear me talk about rubrics a lot because I'm also really into assessment. So you want a clear grading rubric that addresses minimum requirements. The timeliness of post, the number of words in the initial post, how many do you want? Do you want 250, is that the minimum? Is 500 words the maximum? You're gonna want reference and citations because this is scholarly. This isn't just you know, a chat amongst yourselves function. This is really supposed to be substantive work. Responsiveness and collegiality to other students post. And note that minimum is not excellent. So for example, in my courses, the initial post, the student has to put up a response to a discussion board question. It has to be between 200, 500 words and they have to reference this. Then, they must respond to a minimum of two other students in the course. So if they respond to a minimum of two other students in the course, they're gonna lose points. I expect to see three, four, five posts. I actually have had some students do 10 posts they get so excited. So, but remember there is, you know, set the minimum and then tell them they should do more than that. When I have a small class, I will participate in the discussion forums to generate engagement. Otherwise, it's hard to get people talking uh, if there's just you know a small group. When I have a larger class, I let them talk amongst themselves, but I do monitor the conversation, and there'll be more about that later. Emails, phone calls, and text. Notice he's very relaxed. He's looking good. So. The four A's, what's that? Well, you hear this in medicine and you hear it in education as well. Ability, you need to let your audience know you have the expertise to teach them this material through your bio and intro. At the graduate level, I have a lot of students in my program who are very accomplished. They have multiple certifications. They have many things, many initials after their names. They are sometimes skeptical that you actually have the chops to teach this course. And I will say that there are some universities where you do have to wonder about that, but you have the expertise and you wanna let your students know that. Uh, so that's why it's really important for them to see your bio and introduction because you wanna wow them. Uh, affability, you wanna set a welcoming tone through your faculty information, announcements, and conference calls. Attitude. Everyone is anxious, fearful, and grieving. I have uh, many, many friends on the traditional side of my university who are distraught about moving to a fully online format. And they're grieving because they're missing that student contact. And you can acknowledge this new reality, but don't dwell on it. We don't need to be Debbie Downers, oh, woe is me, wringing our hands. I will tell you, contagion, uh, is not a good thing, especially now. Uh, we want optimism. 
optimism is infectious and we need to set an upbeat, optimistic tone with every communication that we give to our students. Availability. Respond to all water cooler questions, emails, phone calls, and texts within 48 hours. This is a mandate, mandate within my uh, university. We are required to respond and it gets back to the don't set it and forget it comment. Welcome phone appointments with students. I allow my students to text me on my cell phone, as many are working in healthcare sites where they have very limited access to email during their shift. Uh, phone appointments, you can post an announcement that says, I welcome phone appointments. Give me a call. I'd be love to talk to you. This is a great icebreaker. Um, many students uh, are fearful, uh, especially if this is the first course they're having with you. They're fearful of having that conversation. Uh, they may or may not, you know, be able to, you know, articulate what their needs are. Uh, this is a good time for you to have that that chat with them, and it serves as an icebreaker. So if there is a problem down the road, if something, if there's a hiccup or a bump, they need an extension for an assignment, or there's something going on in their family or their life they need to talk to you about, they don't feel the fear level that they've had might have had without this first phone call. Group work and virtual teams. I know this is what many families look like now. They got the baby on the lap, the husband's doing the cooking or the wife's doing the cooking, but this is what's happening in homes all over the United States. We want to encourage reciprocity and cooperation among the students. Uh, discussion boards and study groups are effective ways to engage students and encourage reciprocity and cooperation. Uh, study groups would be groups that with students could help each other uh, online uh, in terms of preparing for quizzes or exams. Um, at the graduate level, I don't have quizzes or exams. I have papers only. Uh, but at, you know, it varies amongst universities. Uh, group projects, stop screaming, I hear you, I hear you screaming, are effective for assessing reciprocity, cooperation, and teamwork. And rubrics for grading teamwork are absolutely essential. And this is where I'm going to pimp my book uh, in the latest edition of healthcare, Introduction to Healthcare Management, the fourth edition. In chapter 18, you'll find uh, healthcare management case studies and guidelines, and with the guidelines, you will find rubrics. You'll find rubrics for the paper, you'll find rubrics for presentations, and you will find the all-important teammate evaluations. Students really don't like group work because they don't get to talk about the people who aren't doing their weight. This last rubric addresses the free rider or social loafer concerns, and I can tell you it nips a lot of the stuff in the bud and gives the students effective feedback that makes them stop and think, mm, maybe I should have been more involved in the team. Writing intensive courses lend themselves well to peer review with the professor monitoring each step. Uh, in writing intensive courses, the students submit their original paper to the professor, and then a pair of students exchange papers and mark them up and track changes. These edits are submitted to the professor. That's how you can see if that one student A is giving appropriate feedback to student B. So you're really grading them all along the way and assessing their work. And then the final edits are submitted to the professor for the final paper at the end of this. The bonus for this is at the end of the course, students will have a writing portfolio for job and graduate school applications. Apply the principles of effective feedback. Can I say feedback, 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 feedback? because it's all about the feedback. Again, be responsive. I know I said this already, but respond to all water cooler questions, emails, phone calls, and texts within 48 hours. I do have a few students who get anxious if I don't respond within 20 minutes. Uh, some of them want to do chat, and that not, is not happening, or Facebook, instant messaging. Uh, but if you're responsive, then students feel reassured that you're there for them. And in an online environment, in, in the great cyberspace, it can feel very lonely. So within 48 hours, it gives you the weekend if you don't want to respond on the weekend. Uh, but it's certainly a reasonable length of time within which to respond. Welcome phone appointments. I mentioned that before. And consider allowing them to text you. Return assignments before the next assignment is due to allow students the time to incorporate your feedback in their next submission. Here's an example. 
you have a paper assignment in the first week of the class and you're a little drowning in paperwork and it's a lot to do and so you figure it's not a big deal they'll get it back you know next week the problem is that in the middle of you grading the papers the students are frantically working on their next paper this isn't a course where there's a paper a week due and they don't know what they don't know so in this paper you discover that none of them know how to do APA format but they don't know that they don't know about APA format because they haven't gotten that feedback from you so the next paper you get will have those same mistakes so what you want to do is to be able to have the student incorporate the instructor feedback within their next paper so that they can feel that they've accomplished something and they're not being punished because you weren't fast enough in getting the paperwork done. I like to post my estimated time for return. I, in my syllabus, I have it in Blackboard as well, I'm sorry, but in my learning system. And so you can post it online and in your syllabus. I return papers within five days. I actually return most of my work to students within three days, if not sooner. But five days gives you an ample window to return the paper on weekly assignments so that they can make the repairs to the paper that they need. Effective feedback on assignments is prompt. 48 hours would be great. Um, within five days is great specific very specific it's it's not fun when you get something back let's say you've submitted a paper to a journal and somebody uh, one of the reviewers says this is terrible and you're like what is the whole thing terrible or is it just this section's terrible or you know what's going on here that you don't like so we don't like it they don't like it uh, and they can't do anything with it if it's not specific. Uh, constructive, again, we want to be upbeat. We want to be encouraging. We want to let students know they can succeed at this. Uh, so when you give feedback, do it with a tone that's positive you know, and constructive so that we all feel good about the kind of experience we're having in the online environment. When you provide feedback, greet student by name, thank them for doing the work, provide the constructive feedback and close with a positive message. This is a sandwich technique. It's very useful. It's uh, the students love it. They feel good about it and they think more about that constructive piece in between. Here are some examples of discussion board feedback. Uh, for a student who did a good job, hi student's name. Thank you for your thoughtful analysis and respectful conversations with your classmates. I enjoyed your insights about fill in the blank, something they talked about in discussion board. Please see this week's announcements for more details. Good work, Dr. B. Student didn't post enough. Hi, student's name. Thank you for your thoughtful analysis and respectful conversations with your classmates. Remember to post in a timely manner and more often to receive full credit for this assignment. Please see this week's announcements for more details. I look forward to your participation in our next discussion, Dr. B. Student was off topic. Sometimes they're way off topic. Hi, student's name. I thank you for submitting your post and discussion board this week and your respectful interactions with your classmates. Unfortunately, the topic we were discussing was ABC, but you posted about XYZ. In the future, please read the assignment carefully to ensure staying on topic. I look forward to your participation in our next discussion. Dr. B. Emphasize time on task and deadlines. Tick tock, the clock is ticking. Students need help in learning to manage and prioritize their study time. I know even as a young professional, I struggled with trying to figure out what was more important than what. And I had to learn to go to my boss and say, I have this laundry list of things you want me to do, what's the most important? So part of your job is to let the students know what's most important at this time. So that's why having the deadlines and the assignments for the following week and the announcements is an important piece of information to communicate. Your syllabus, online course, and announcements should reinforce the due dates. I recommend giving a realistic preview of how much time they should be expected to work on a course per week. And at the graduate level at our program, we recommend 10 to 15 hours per week and on assignments within a course. Uh, with respect to group assignments, I tell students that they need to start working on it week one. 
because it's a big piece of their grade and it's a lot of work. So they need they need, they cannot dilly dally. They must move on it. Assignment due dates must be explicit, consistent across the syllabus and online course, and date and time stamped upon submission. Uh, sometimes, you know, professors forget to do that, and then you get people who just sort of spottily send in their assignments because, oh, when I click on this link, there's no date or time that it's due. Uh, you want to set up a clear submission time with a little wiggle room. For example, for an end of day due date, 11.45 p.m., not 12 a.m. I don't know about you, but I get a little confused between 12 a.m. and midnight. And when I see that and read it quickly, I'm not sure what I'm doing. 11.45 p.m. is much more, you know, black and white, very clear. And it also gives the student a little wiggle room in terms of if they submit a little bit later, you can accept it. Um, I have late policies in my uh, syllabi. But, you know, this is something that's up to you if you're going to take a late assignment. But having that, that crisp cutoff is a good thing to do. Communicate high expectations. You can do it. We want you to succeed. We want to have high but reasonable expectations for your students. We are, you know, if you're teaching at the undergraduate level, don't give students graduate level expectations. You really have to, you know, teach to your audience, teach at the level that you expect the student to be. I don't teach at the doctoral level. I teach at the master's level for my master's students. So keep that in mind when you're setting your expectations. Provide specific, clear, detailed directions for assignments in the syllabus in the online course. Uh, one of the things that I mentioned before is that I require students to bring five questions for group work to our first conference call. And what I do with that information is I put it in a frequently asked questions document, which I post in my course so students can go back to it and they can see, oh, she already answered that question. Oh, I, uh, now I get it. Okay, now we're fine. So having that reinforcement of the conference call with the document is very helpful. And you don't get a lot of emails going, so what did you say about this? It's all there. Uh, post templates in your online course for the assignments for, for students to follow. We had a terrible time uh, initially uh, when we were having the students do cases for the healthcare management courses. They were sort of scribbling down whatever they wanted. They, they weren't following what I thought were clear instructions, uh, but they, uh, they just didn't get it. That worked so much better when I just simply posted a template in the course. Here's your first page. Here are your subject headings. Within the subject heading, here are the areas you should address. Here's the reference page. It made life a lot simpler for them and for me. And their grades got a lot better. So highly recommend templates. Again, use conference calls, water cooler and announcements to clarify questions on assignments. Provide extra learning tips on assignments for references and resources, where to start and how to chunk the work. Students oftentimes get so overwhelmed when they look at the syllabus, they don't, they get breathless. They don't know where to start. And I know that feeling. When I did my dissertation, I, I didn't know what I was going to do, but I did know that I could start with doing abstracts. So I knew I had to have a literature review. So I learned to chunk the work in terms of literature review. Then I learned to chunk the work for the hypothesis generation. Then I learned to chunk the work for the data gathering. So, but that's something they don't naturally come by. So teaching students how to chunk the work so that it's like, you know, much more manageable for them. Uh, some people call it the salami technique. You slice off a piece at a time. You're not going to eat the whole salami at the same time. You're going to eat a piece at a time. And this is what we want to convey to our students, that this is good time management. Uh, extra learning tips, I do things like writing tips. I have students at the graduate level who still use a lot of passive voice. Now, I teach a lot of nurses and I teach a lot of healthcare managers who really just make short notes at a chart in a large part. And so their, their patient did this and, you know, something or another was administered. And so it, a lot of passive voice creeps in, their notes are very short, so they're very surprised, some of them, when I point out that their paper had 58% passive voice. Um, that's something that you can put up really easily. Word has it as an option for readability. Uh, I also like to use uh, you know, other writing tips about you know, commas. Oh my God, commas. People can go crazy with commas. Do you use the Oxford comma or not? So 
those sorts of things are really added value for your students. Create a space for diverse talents and ways of learning. One size does not fit all. I really fell in love with this graphic because every light bulb was a little different and everyone had a little different thing. And so I, I think this is just a perfect image for, you know, one size does not fit all. Students need the opportunity to demonstrate their talents and to apply their learning to make it relevant to them. It's so hard to work on assignments that really don't relate to their lives. Uh, what does this have to do with me? How am I going to use this in the future? I asked about that in geometry when I was in high school. Why? Do, when am I ever going to use geometry? I never planned to be an architect. I was going to be writing the great American novel. But students are asking these questions as well. How is this relevant to me? So you want to generate assignments that make it make them able to apply it to their lives. Have a policy for accommodations in your syllabus. Do students need extra time? Do they need to work with the Disability Support Services Department? Do they have the documentation they need? Um, that all should all be within your policy for who they should contact. Another way to do this is to scaffold assignment to provide opportunities for feedback on smaller submissions to help with larger work. So the smaller submissions would be smaller assignments. This week, we're going to do a two to three page case study analysis. And then you can provide the students feedback on that first case study. So on the next case study, that might be four to five pages. They'll be a little bit more confident when they go into it. So you just want to build it and stair step it and scaffold it for them. You also want to vary assignments to enable students to demonstrate their talents and competencies in different ways. Not everybody can write a great research paper. Um, you want to be able to have discussion boards. Uh, students can do videos in my learning system. We have VoiceThread, and a lot of professors like to have students introduce themselves in VoiceThread. Wikis is another way where students can show their abilities. Group work, stop screaming. Presentations, peer reviewers, research papers, and case studies are all re really good. Uh, and I'm sure you can think of many more different assignments that would give you variety and the student variety in their work. Be open to student feedback. This is a hard one. I had to learn it. Have students review the syllabus and the online course for errors, inconsistency, and clarity. Make this an assignment. You can give five points for this, and that's the sort of thing that students looking for, you know, that extra two points, they'll do this. And have them come to you. I, I learned that from the student who emailed me 475 times about that one mistake. Uh, you want to make sure you catch those early. And when they do find errors, and they will, accept their responses and corrections with gratitude. Oh, thank you. Post an announcement. Thanks to Joe, who caught this error. Here's the correction. I really appreciate your input. Uh, be respectful of all students and communications. And if you're having a moment, don't respond. It's the same thing we tell our students. Don't send flamers. Don't respond when you're angry. If you are upset with a student and their performance and their behavior, step away from the computer, take a deep breath, and let it go. And then come back when you can right in a calmer manner. I know it can be hard sometimes. I've had students who've been incredibly disrespectful to me. I've had to do exactly that. Take a deep breath, walk away, and respond with comment, you know, with a calm feedback email. So keep that in mind. Online relearning is not bias free. Just because we can't see our students doesn't mean that they will be, you know, that we won't assume things or that they don't assume things about each other. People's names are a dead giveaway. There's lots of literature that report supports this. I've done a fair amount of research on diversity in online education. That's a whole other presentation. But this is a big issue in online education. People assume, oh, I can't see them. How could I possibly be biased? Students sometimes post things in discussion boards or elsewhere that they would not say face to face to another person. You know, they hide behind the computer. They think that no one can see them. It's no big deal. It is a big deal. And this is one of the reasons you must monitor the conversations. Project implicit 
from Harvard University can help you and your students learn about biases. This is really an important teaching for all of us. So this webinar has given participants the ability to generate student faculty contacts, encourage reciprocity and cooperation among students, apply the principles of effective feedback, emphasize time on task and deadlines, communicate high expectations, and create a space for diverse talents and ways of learning. I want to thank you for serving our country. What you're doing is critical. We are educating our next generation, and COVID-19 will be our students' generational touchstone. You can connect with other professors who are transitioning to online teaching in this really fun Facebook group. And I want you to remember, like Rosie the Riveter, we are all in this together and we can do it. Thank you for coming and thank you for being with us. Thank you, Sharon. On behalf of Jones and Bartlett Learning, I want to thank um, Dr. Sharon Bookbinder for sharing her expertise in this insightful presentation. We hope this is helpful to you as you're putting your classes online and we wish you all the luck in your online teaching. Jones and Bartlett is pulling together a landing page for online teaching resources, and we shared this link below. Best of luck, and thank you for joining our presentation today.